Welcome to NAFA's Advisor Today podcast series, where we focus on how financial advisors work, live, and give to their local communities and our greater financial services industry. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, everyone. This is Chris Gandy, one of your co-hosts for Advisor Today's podcast with our wonderful co-host, uh, Suzanne Kirwan. Hi, Suzanne. How are you? Hey, Chris. Good to see you. Welcome today to our bow tie edition. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we, we have the, the one of the greats, Mr. Joe Jordan here. We'll get to him in a second, but uh, I look forward to interviewing him and having a really good time as we talk about why Joe is, is, is unique in his own way. Um, so Suzanne, uh, here to share our sponsor for today's podcast. Yeah, today we're sponsored by Columbus Life. And so um, if you're a NAFA member, you'll receive your print edition of the Advisor Day magazine roughly about mid-July. And on the back cover, you're going to see one of Columbus Life's new products. Check that out and look for your uh, inbox as well to see an edition with that. But we thank Columbus Life for their sponsorship and their friendship. Thank you, Suzanne. So um, with no further ado, um, those who don't know uh, this young man, but uh, I'll just say that. Uh, I met him and I was like, wow, that guy actually looks pretty cool wearing, wearing, wearing a bow tie. And um, um, he, he must be pretty, pretty unique. So, Mr. Joe Jordan, welcome to the Advisor Today podcast. So happy to, so happy you're here. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm really, uh, I'm really happy to be with you today. Um, so with that being said, you know, let's, let's jump right in. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, this probably, if, if not might be the most watched podcast you know joe you'll, you'll have to beat beat mine i think mine so far has been you know done really well so they're looking for some amazing nuggets so they can watch it over and over again okay okay right. so so joe let's let's start with with let's rewind the tape you know you've you've i've seen you on magazines i've seen you and you know speaking on stage you know you didn't start there so tell us a little bit about how you started in the insurance and financial services business? Well, I'll tell you, um, uh, uh, you know, my, my background was uh, I, I, I my mother was widowed when I was very young. I was six months old when my father died. And uh, actually, he was an advisor to Harry Truman, you know, and so we used to have a different lifestyle and that all got changed. So um, I never reflected on that or or what have you. I just went through normal stuff and, you know, uh, I, I did that. Uh, so I wound up in the life insurance business, not because of my personal background, but uh, I was a Catholic big brother. I wanted to do that because I grew up without a father. And um, I think that's important. And uh, uh, one of the guys on the board of the Catholic big brothers was a guy named Tom Costello, who played linebacker for the Giants, which was my other religion. So um, uh, he told me I should, you know, join home life. And so I did what a New York Giant told me to do. So I had no predisposition or passion or saying, you know, someday I'll get into this thing. And and then I, I got into it. And of course, it was uh, this, the, the middle 70s. And then then I became a child of the 80s. Um, I left home life because I went to Payne Weber, which was a wirehouse on Wall Street, stock brokerage firm. And and uh, I had insurance background. So I wasn't the greatest insurance guy in the world, but at Payne Weber, I was, you know, <laughs> so uh, but I had to get people to change behavior to sell insurance instead of just stocks and bonds. And this is the early 80s, man. So the culture was completely different. And so I had that. And then um, having had that background, I went to MetLife and I ran their annuity business because I had that background. And the benefit I had was uh, MetLife kept importing people from, you know, Merrill Lynch or places like that, but didn't understand the life insurance culture. And having been a life agent, knowing that insurance people back then were brought up to be income gatherers. They weren't asset gatherers. They didn't ask people for $100,000. You know, they were asking for, you know, $500 a month or something like that. So I understood that. And so I had to change their behavior. So so that's how I got in the business. And then I, I bit into the bullet of, uh, you know, how much money I can make. So I was on the dark side, you know. Um, uh, that, that's what it was. It was kind of impersonal and, and very much a product talk, which there's nothing wrong with products, but don't get me wrong. So I, I think what you want to get me towards is how did I get to where I am now? And, uh, uh, slowly, but surely, um, um, 
I began to take a look at financial services and I found it to be good because you know what I, I was challenged. I had to, I had to learn about financial planning because I had to introduce it at MetLife. I didn't know anything about it. And then as I began to look at it, all of the stuff that we have in financial services, all this technical gobbledygook that doesn't really connect with people. And the whole thing of the business is the relationships you create and whether or not you become trustworthy or not. And uh, and then I began to look at the idea, which I thought I, I, we had a lot of it in the 70s when I started. It's almost non-existent now is why we do what we do. And then all of a sudden it was a reflection in terms of my life, my 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 lifestyle, growing up without a father and, and a father who uh, cashed in a hundred thousand dollar New York life policy um, six months before about six months before he was killed in a car accident. Hmm. So I began to realize, I said, man, you know what $100,000 was in 1952, all right? I mean, you could buy a kick-ass house for $8,000, right? <laughs> Our lives would have been radically different. I mean, that was the transformation that happened. Because what happened is I never got, when I spoke at MDRT in 2004, it was on the main platform, made me reflect on it. And I was going through a completely different phase. I was I was very animated. It, 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 uh, I, I was angry at my father. It was the first time, 54 years of age. That's how long it took me to figure it out. And 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 so to me, I'll just say this. I think God put me in that position because I didn't have any predisposition towards that before. And then I began to realize when I thought about what my family went through, my mother and two sisters working, making certain I could get a car because I wanted to play baseball or catcher's equipment. Everything we did was a struggle and all this other stuff like that. So that's when I began a transformation to understand that what we really do is have a major impact on people's lives. And so that's why that was the genesis behind living a significant life, because I don't think we talk about it. It's really the impact that we have on others. And I and I think to some extent, our, our culture has been so self-oriented that I wanted to bring out that aspect of it. And I think that if you have, uh, um, uh, 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 I think human beings are built to help others. And, and I think that's the true satisfaction. That's what people really get. A lot of people become very wealthy and a lot of money, but they're not very happy. And uh, 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 so that 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 was the thing that came to me. So that that's kind of a shorthand of how I got into the business, how I transformed in the business and what my message is. And uh, uh, and and so right now, what I like to talk about is not just the facts and the numbers. It's not a story in the numbers. It's the number of stories and 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 trying to bring that into place so that we communicate better with people and and save lives. And, you know. I did the research and found out everyone dies, you know, and that includes us. So, you know, what better impact could you have if there are people out there who, 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 who have really benefited as a result of what you do? But not only in death, but also in terms of now we have this other problem of living too long. So you know, it used to be just die too soon. Now it's living too long. And a lot of our products, you might run out of money, but you'll never run out of income. So think about that. And that, that's a that's a radical change. So I, I do think that right now in our business, we deal with the major issue the planet faces. I don't think it's global warming. I think it's the aging population of the world. More importantly, the, the narrowing of the working age population, trying to support all of these people who lived before. So it's like what Nick Murray says, it's yo-yo. You're on your own. So that's that's what we help to do. And so that's 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 that's, that's kind of my summary. So. so I was gonna I was gonna say so I, I did see you speak recently in, in Chicagoland when we were kind of on the speaker circuit together there, Joe. And you know, you you spoke specifically about the living too long and how this is a primarily a, a woman's issue. So did did that also connect then with your mother and sisters? Like did you have that real kind of impact? Is that is that part of what's really fueling that as well? I yeah, I mean, I grew up in a maternal household, so I had a different perspective in terms of things that went on. So I was more sensitive to, to women's issues because I saw, I mean, my mother went from going to the White House for tea to become a secretary in the bartender's local in the Bronx. And I watched the way women got treated and, and what have you. And so so that that was it. So, um, you know, I'll just tell you this, 80 percent of men die married and 80 percent of women die single. So, you know, life insurance is a woman's issue. And then on top of that, you know, 
I always ask this question, and most people get it wrong. We go, what country has the most people over age 100? Everyone thinks it's Japan. Well, per capita, Japan does, but it's the United States by a mile. For every guy over age 100, there's five women. So longevity is a women issue. So when you look, take into consideration the fact that 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 uh, uh, right now people are living too long, not too long, but living longer is the fact that they need to have some form of guarantees. And that's that's the other end of life insurance, right, as annuities. You know, the people who die pay for the people who live and, and uh, 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 excuse me, the people who live pay for the people who die in life insurance and the people who die pay for the people who live in, in, in annuities. So giving people guaranteed lifetime income is important. And it's specifically, I think, a women's issue. So, so Joe, let's let's dig into that a little bit. So you mentioned it's a woman's issue. So if we think about the people coming into our business, right, let's shift gears. If we think about the people coming into our business, does that mean that that insurance companies, um, the recruiters should start looking at how to include more women into the workforce as it deals with them? If you look at the financial services industry, it's at 95% male, right? Okay. So does that mean that from your perspective, that that would be a way of, of, of growing, you know, if I'm, if I'm a company, is that a way that I, I look at growing through, through women's initiatives and diverse initiatives? Is, is that what you're, can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, but my, my point is it solves a business issue. It, it goes beyond just all of the things that we like to say is, you know, there's equity and there's all that stuff. No, it solves a business issue because I think where the business is going, it's going towards the idea because before you could dazzle people with numbers, now everyone has a computer and all this other stuff and access to information that they never had before. Okay, so now it's really the important part of creating the relationships and women do that instinctively. On top of which, they're the ones most vulnerable to the product types of that we sell. Being alone, uh, uh, you know, and 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 then you know having having an income. So yes, I I do think men can get sensitized to it, but I do think women do that instinctively, and I think we just have to have more representation. And again, that comes from growing up and observing the stuff my mother went through from you know from up here you know to down there and. And 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 what she had to do. So yes, I I do think that beyond just the platitudes of it's socially acceptable, you know, to be diverse, this really solves a business issue. And 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 you have to begin to recognize that men are different from women. You know, they don't fake it till they make it. They really want to know it. You know, there's a lot of things that have to go on, and you can't do a seven a.m. meeting when someone has to take a kid to school. You know, so um, um, it, it's all it's all of those things. So I do think that's that's an important initiative we need to do. So, so let's, let's talk about kind of what's going on in, in your world. Um, would you say that, you know, if I was having this conversation with you 20 years ago, what kind of advice would you give your, yourself 20 years ago if you were starting in the business at that time? By the way, Joe, could you share with everyone, how long have you been in the life insurance game or financial services game at some level? Well, it's uh, it's fifty years now, so um, that's a long time. <laughs> started in uh, started in nineteen seventy four, so uh, it's uh, it, it's been a while. So so I've seen it all, and uh, you know it used to be we had whole life an uncompetitive term, you know, and that was uh, you know that was it, and you had to be criminally insane to 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 run a, a mutual company out of business, you know. It was you know pretty simple. And then I watched all the complexities as it came together, you know. Um, uh, what what really started, Wall Street started getting into our business. And so that's why I made the shift to Payne Weber. And, uh, and, and but I, one of the things I will tell you, it had nothing to do with client centricity. It had nothing to do with taking care of clients. It was just diversifying revenue streams. So it was always business. And, and so, you know, I watched that happen. And so now I think we're getting to the point in terms of, uh, I think our business is less client centric than most of the businesses that were out there, and I, that's why we paid a price for it. So um, uh, um, that's that's you know that that that's what I believe in, and I think this next phase that we're going towards is the idea 
that um, uh, um, uh, 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 we have to get to the point where, and I'll talk more about this a little bit later, um, that one of the things of aging is we used to think if we took care of someone financially, it was done. Well, all of the products we sell, as you know, can be commoditized, right? So um, uh, uh, I think in the future, and one of the think tanks came out with this, I can't remember the name of it, said uh, that um, uh, in 10 years, people in our business will be acting more like uh, uh, life coaches, you know, life financial coaches. What are you going to do? The fact that you're living longer, you know, now you're getting older. So um you, I, well I, i'm jumping ahead of myself but you asked the question what would i have said to myself 20 years ago uh i wish i had been more enlightened earlier in my career than i was um and uh uh, uh, uh and, and you know back then there was more of this well it's funny because in the uh, in the olden days when i started the products weren't all that good but the culture was kind of right dealing with why maybe covering up for some of the product issues that are there. Now the products are really great and we're just talking numbers to people. So, so I, I do think that, uh, that, you know, that's, that's what I try to bring to the table. So, so Joe, you mentioned that. So tell us a little bit about what you have going on now. I mean, 50 years in, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some people may say, Hey, Joe, it's, it's time to retire, right? You're saying, no, I'm going, I'm going hard. I'm going 100. percent Share yeah. with us what do you have going now um, with your website? You're going around. You're talking to companies. Tell us. Share. Share. Share a little bit on your initiatives today and how people can connect with you. Well, you know, once again, you know, I backed into the life insurance business unconsciously, you know, because of something else. And then look at me now. I'm 71 and I'm running like I'm 22 years old. You know, I I I, I was just in in Thailand and then went to Jamaica. You know, uh, but I live for it. But I I never thought of the idea because remember one of the one of the problems of this aging population is you know people retire and and then they think it's going to be this one great thing of playing golf or whatever. It, it isn't even if you have enough money. You need meaning and purpose. And so, again, I backed into it. I didn't I didn't consciously go out to do this. I mean, one of the one of the uh, uh, astronauts said, if you think going to the moon is hard, try staying home. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that 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 that's an issue. You need meaning and purpose. So, I again, I just backed into it. That, that, that's the evolution that I've seen where I think the business is going towards. We have to be able to counsel people that they they have to be able to make a plan to do something. Because what what what's happened is is and especially exacerbated by the by the pandemic is um isolation. And isolation kills. It's it, it they've done a study and they said people who have a severe sense of isolation and this can be you can be married and have grandchildren and still be isolated because you're you're disconnected from what you used to do. You know, used to be in who's who. Now no one knows who the hell you are, you know, and that's a that's a tough adjustment to be able to, you know, to, to make. So I think that, <laughs> excuse me. So I think with me, I just, you know, kept doing it because what else am I going to do? And I, 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 I now get some good, you know, great fulfillment because I, I wake up, I got stuff to do and. I got to dial and smile like you and I get rejected and all this other stuff. And I got to think crap up and what have you, but it keeps me occupied and keeps me going. And, and, and that, that I think is the new future. That's the big risk we face because if, if, if you have this, people have to be responsible for themselves because a lot of the, the, the governmental type, uh, you know, uh, safety nets just, just, just can't afford it. And, and, you know, just to get some proof on it, if, if you looked at it, you know, look what's going on now in, uh, um, the, I don't know if you saw this, but in the UK, the, the, uh, their, their, their medical thing, you know, it's all government run, is really in crisis now. And it's only going to get worse. Yeah. France was, went nuts going from 62 to 64. I mean, riots in the streets, you know. And, and so I think those are, those are issues that are coming up that we help to solve. And, uh, 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 and that's why I think it's important what we do. I, and, and I'll just throw this other ad in there for, for NAFA. I always love NAFA because of the fact that it preserved my livelihood. 
the hell with the livelihood. Without us, what the hell are people going to do? I mean, you saw some of the nutty things that came out of the state of Washington. That long term care thing was a nightmare. The, the premiums were ridiculous. The benefits were. And if you moved out of the state. So the politicians are well-meaning, but they, they don't know how to do this. This is this is this is the significant issue that we're facing. And so I think beyond just saving your livelihood, it's also the idea that we do a lot of good out there. And I want to make sure I get that point across. You know, Joe, um, people can identify you. You you do stand out in the crowd, mm-hmm. not because of the debonair, uh, you know, um, goatee, you know. But <laughs> but where did the bow tie come from? You know, I I heard that you match and mirror your your uh, who you're talking to. So <laughs> I decided to put a bow tie on today for this see honor to interview you and the shoes. Don't yeah, forget the shoes. No, I wear I wear the the uh, the, the two tone shoes. I remember I because I got selected to speak at MDRT. This was 2004. And so that's when I got started with it. And so my wife's going, don't wear those shoes. I said, Gerald, I'm under enough pressure. Please don't put this on me. I know what I'm doing. So, you know, I got up and I spoke. And then a woman woman came on after me. Patrice Berry was her name. And and she goes, the man with the beautiful shoes. So so what happened was, I'll just tell you, this guy's go. Yeah, who's a guy? He did a great speech. I don't know. I forgot his name. It's the guy with the bow tie, the shoes. You know, so so that that turned into a, a moniker, and it's kind of a you know a differentiator. It's, it's like Tom Hegner wears the orange shirts all the time. So that's 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 kind of his thing. You know. So I think you're salmon. I think it it's specifically goes with the salmon pink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, personal brand pieces. Yeah. Up. Yeah. 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 So did you uh, did you give it back to your wife where you're like, hey, I was right. See, it worked forever after. No, no, I've never I've never done that, you know, but it was just under so much pressure. And then I have to hear, you know, you don't look right. (laughs) So 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 a unique value proposition. Right. You know, people will remember you by not what they see or what they hear, but the the combination of all those things that they remember. But I think, Joe, you have a you have a fantastic message. One is that. You know, I've I've heard numerous speakers in our industry. You know, when you're brand new, you know, you look and you say, okay, where do the 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 Godfathers hang out at, right? Where where do they hang? I need to talk to those guys. Mm-hmm. And and I remember the one of the first times I made MDRT. I remember standing in line to come talk to you and say, hey, listen, I, I appreciate everything you said. I'm going to take it and I'm going to run with it. I remember you saying something like. I, I think you're going to stand out in a crowd, even though I always stand out in a crowd because I'm super tall. Right? <laughs> yeah, I stand out in a crowd, very observant of you, right? But but I re- I remember that, right? And uh, to this day, I, I remember that that was in oh my goodness, 2000, like the year 2000, 2001. I was I was MBRT. Wow. Wow. So um, no, I've I've done MBRT numerous times since, and towards the table, top of the table, all that fun stuff. And and you're right, there is. I believe that as an advisor, you transition into that idea of being a a, a coach right. to people because the products agnostic to each company, they're unique in their own way. No one has the market corner on ideas, right? But but your approach to the public, because the a public is is evolving so fast, right? right? They're evolving so fast that that it, it makes you want to and 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 have to upgrade your skill, right? Mm-hmm. Make you make it so that you're more marketable. We have to as advisors. So you in the business, but can you talk a little bit about you mentioned this longevity being a women's issue? Right. Um is there do do you see that 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 the products specifically are geared towards the way in which women buy these products or are the insurance companies still kind of in the dark with we're going to make these products this way and at the end of the day that the communication and even the marketing aren't to that specific niche space well um i i don't know i i I, i'm not smart enough to figure out how i would alter the products you know uh there i think the messaging is something that needs to you know needs to be done I know the biggest issue, and I don't know to what extent it exists now, but, you know, it used to be man on man, right? You know, I'm going to talk to the man, you know, and so I forget the statistics, but it's huge, right? The the number of women who become single 
uh, they how, what percentage of them change their financial advisor? Because I think I think to some extent we've been getting that those out, and and mostly it's been uh, been somewhat successful because it impacts the wallet. You know what I mean? You lose clients as a result of that. So I think there's been a lot of sensitivity mm -hmm. towards that. I also think there's a lot more women in the business than had been. You know, I always admire, uh, you know, Robel and Abade, for example, down in Louisiana and a few other women that I know. I can't imagine showing up at MDRT. And there's 15,000 guys there and, and there's six women, you know, what that must have been like. And uh, so I, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, and uh, 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 I, I think women will take more senior roles and they would know better than I would in terms of how to, you know, best appeal, uh, best appeal to women. But again, they were always in the backdrop, but the, you know, since they're alive and they're, they're managing the money, they're going to go to somebody else. And so I think that's, uh, I think that's, that's been, I don't know to what extent it's been successful, but I think that's there. So, so Joe, you, let's talk about the evolution of the industry. So, you know, the, the, the banks are in the insurance business. So are the, so are the wirehouses, right? The, the insurance companies are in the investment business. Um, you know, it's just kind of muddled up. Right. And so um, you've seen that evolve. Right. Where do you see this going? Because if we're, we're on fast forward at this point, um, where we're going is light years away. Do you see that there will be a time where we as financial advisors become obsolete? I don't see that. No, I really don't. I, I really don't. And that's because we have to adapt the human side of what we do. And um, uh, uh, I, I was there. I mean, in 1974, as I said, I had whole life an uncompetitive term. Um, and then, you know, wound up at Payne Weber. And this was a place that, you know, was selling stocks and bonds, was selling greed and uh, asset gathering and insurance people fear and income gathering, you know, but they were coming together. And again, as I said before, it wasn't for any purpose of taking care of clients. It was just, you know, revenue uh, diversity, you know, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I I don't think everyone always thought, look, and then I was going through the stages that I was at Payne Weber, I had to make that change. And then everyone said the computers are coming out and everyone's going to buy this stuff you know, online it just doesn't happen. There's a, there's a whole emotional equation that's, that's lost. I think that, that gets lost in our business. Uh, the other part of the future is, uh, the life insurance culture is really at risk. Um, uh, you know, before, if that's the only thing you could sell, you, you had the culture. Um, now it's just so much cooler and easier to be dealing with the finances and what have you. And, um, uh, and 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 so my concern is that that and and hopefully as people begin to understand the only thing that really works is something that's financial in nature that impacts your revenues. So if you're losing a lot of women because you never incorporated them, you're going to learn from that lesson. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know so so you learn from that. And I do think that the people who are going to be acting more like coaches, and that's highlighted in in that book from Gary Sirak, because he, he backed into it too. He didn't, he didn't consciously come to this recognition, which is the idea of creating those relationships by asking people questions about what they're going to do in retirement, for example, creating a tighter relationship. And then it isn't a question of saying, what do you charge for this? How much are your fees? You know, all, all of that other stuff. It becomes a, a, a critical issues because I saw the thing. It used to be package sales. So I'd go and do a package sale. Then I started the fee-based financial planning. And that's where you were asking questions. But the fee-based planning was it was so technical in nature, the questions that you'd ask, you know, you know, what what are your plans? You know, what what's your the problem's not the problem. People don't even know how to think about the problem. You, we got to humanize more in terms of 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 finding out what people want to do and what plans they they've put together. And so, um, uh, you know, people say, what's your plan? What are you talking about a plan? I've been living day to day, you know? So I, so that's where I think there's two books. One is the Gary Sirak book. Um, the other one is uh, um, Mitch Anthony, okay? Uh, he has a book out. Um, I don't have it in front of me, sorry. Um, oh, maybe I can find it. I, I'll, I'll look for it in a second here. Um, he talks about the... Uh, 
the, the technical way of changing of the types of questions to ask people. It's always great when some visionary gets up and says, your whole business is changing, you're better with that. But they don't give you a, they don't give you a, a, a way to do that. And um, uh, Mitch Anthony, I think, has been a, been a leader in that. So I always like a lot of his books. So I would say Mitch Anthony and Gary Searock are two books you should get. I have one question for you. What about your book? So you, you wrote a book called A Life of Significance, yes? Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. So um, looking dapper on the cover. Uh -huh. um, can you share with us? So if you don't have it or you have not read it, go out and get it. Can we still get it on Amazon? Uh, you can't get it on Amazon. You have to go through my my website, which is just josephjordan.com. Okay, that's perfect. So know, they, they, they give me $2. For so, yeah. so let's go make sure you get the book. So give me a highlight. What what made you say, I'm going to write a book? Like, And here's what I want people to get. And, and with that, part B is, what do you want people to get out of the book? And when's, well, when's the next book coming out? Okay. <laughs> well, the next book, the first one almost killed me, so I don't know yet. But, uh, but, but, but uh, what I wanted, I wanted to put in a personal story. You know, again, all of the stuff was technical in nature and more math oriented, and I wanted to just tell my story. And and uh, uh, you know, it was very dramatic. As the other thing that happened during the '80s was a lot of investment people were getting in the insurance business, and and what happened was interest rates were at 14, 15%. So unlike New York Life and MetLife that had these huge bond portfolios underwater, they could charge, give any rate they wanted. But they understood investments. They didn't understand liabilities. And so that's where we had some, you know, disruptions. You know, Baldwin United went out and executive life had to be taken over. And so that was a pretty traumatic, you know, uh, uh, you know, situation that happened. So um, I, 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 I kind of lived through that. And so, you know, that's something that, 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 that I, I wanted, I wanted to get through a story. I also wanted to say how the business changed, which you asked me before started out with just those two products, the company the products came together. I think there's an invisible hand of people are really driving this. I don't, I don't think the regulators are driving it. People want to talk to one person. They don't want to talk to seven. And 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 they want to have all of this stuff taken care of. And so I think that was the driving force behind it. I wanted to get that out. And then I wanted to tell my story, you know, the fact that I was totally oblivious to all of the stuff. You know, I was six months old. My father died. And so I just had to make do. And then it wasn't it was the catharsis at 54 years of age at, on the stage of MDRT. It came to, you know, what if my father where's the New York life agent who told my father do not cancel this thing, right? Again, 100,000 bucks would have made our lives radically different. You know, I have two sisters who never went to college because my mother decided the girls had to go to work to make sure the boys went to college. And let me tell you something, I'm 71 and I'm the baby and that's as alive today as it was back then. These are real pressing issues that people face. And so I wanted to get that humanity out. And then I just had a lot, number of other stories from other people in the business and the impact that they had. And it's, it's, and we just don't talk enough about it. So I think that's the thing that I get driven to. And maybe they think, oh, you know, isn't it nice? He tells nice stories, whatever. But that's the thing that does it. How, how the hell did people put up with, you know, calling on the phone and getting rejected and what have you? There's got to be something other than just, you know, how much money you make. Now, look, I'm, I'm not, I, I was in the business, so I know it. Uh, I'm not being story eyed, but I do think there has to be some element that we constantly have to reinforce the idea that we're a force for good, that we are, I think, the, dealing with the major issue the planet faces from it used to be people die too soon. Now it's live too long. And and um, uh, I I don't I don't see it happening with just computers popping up and making stuff happen. And it's also a great way to make a living. And I've also known known some other organizations that are beginning to pop up that are that are doing you know great work, and uh, and and I, I do think we have to get more diverse. We have to you know uh, not just gender, but also you know race. The, the, the other benefit of all of these different uh, cultures that are in our that are in our our the United States now, they have to be served, and it's very underserved. There's Vince Vitiello 
Uh, he's wrote, he's written a great book. He says, you know, diversity means more bucks. And you just can't believe some of the some of the things that are out there. And and these are great people. They have great, great values, family values, and they need to be taken care of. So I would say women and then also the idea of a lot of the diverse cultures that we have in our country right now. Suzanne, you look like you have a question. You look yeah. like you're like, there's a question on the on my on tip of my tongue. <laughs> well, you know, I was going to ask you to kind of give also your view on, you know, we're in this post COVID world now and certainly COVID, you know, you're talking about the greatest challenge we have is aging. And we have that on one hand and then we have the housing, right? Where are we going to put people? Like, what's that going to look like? You know, how, how do, how does that look? I, I think all of it is changing. Right. And so the p point I was just going to ask your opinion on is that the innovation, I think we're going to see in the next 10 to 20 years around aging Right. And also we let's face facts, I think as Americans, we're going to have to change our cultural norms to 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 a certain extent about aging and also death and end of life, which I think the life insurance life agents have come to grips with that, you know, long ago. And they understand kind of the, the purpose of this product and kind of that noble piece of it. But I was going to ask your opinion on how, how do we take that and what do you see happening there with that type of an aging population with, you know, that's the United States has never seen that. You know, we've walked around with baby boomers for right decades now. And then the previous generations were very small and then war made them even smaller. So what is your take on that, Joe? Well, I think product development has been very helpful. I mean, we now have living values, you know, which we didn't have before. You bought life insurance and you, you know, you hope you die when it's in force. You know, now there are tremendous stories about people using the proceeds for living values in terms of being able to pay for things that aren't covered. I mean, I have a, uh, 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 I, I, I have, I have a link that people can get and you can you, you do it on my website. I just don't have it in front of me right now where I'll send you two stories a month for six months free. And what I'm trying to do is to reorient people towards that. And one of the stories is a young woman who is a parent and lives with her parents but she's the sole support and uh, she got she got beaten up accosted and and seriously injured uh but she was able to advance four hundred thousand dollars from her life insurance policy to pay all of her medical expenses and kept the family intact that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago you know so so i think the products have really been addressing the fact that people need more and then also uh, that's a young woman there's a there's there's long-term care incidents that that could happen. You know, some people just can't afford long-term care, but something's better than nothing. So I think the product lines have really have really advanced in terms of the benefits, you know, that people have the ability to get. And then you get into all of the other things that are there. And you have to talk to people about preparation. You know, uh, my my mother was in a hospital bed in my apartment, you know, for a while. And I'm married to a saint. She didn't mind. But you know what happens is. You can tear families apart when you have this, uh, you know, uneven caregiving being provided by the dutiful daughter. Uh, I'm making it up. You know what I mean? The daughter versus the three other siblings and all of this other stuff. So this is really important stuff, which is now completely. You're absolutely right. We haven't experienced this before. Now people live. Now, they might live a long time, but they may not be healthy and they may be broke. And, uh, and you look at China for crying out loud. One kid. And then how many grand and, and they're being obligated by law. And this all started from a standpoint of, you know, the one child policy. It's um, it's really something that that that's 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 creeping up on us. And I think we deal with it directly. And uh, I think we should just be be talking more about it. So I think from a product perspective, I think we've we've improved pretty dramatically. But you would contend we still need to keep having that conversation. Oh, and, absolute, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And and then you know also the um, the facilities that would be available, you know, for people and and, uh, uh, and 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 how that operates. So yeah, I mean that's why I think there has to be more presence of mind. I don't know about global warming. Maybe it'll start getting cooler. But I know for sure what's happening with the population is that's that's that you know that. Uh, uh, that's going to be there. Mm -hmm. You look at um, last couple of questions for you. So, sure. so where are you going to be? You know, where in the world is Joe Jordan? 
I mean, you're, you're all over the place. You're in Taiwan. <laughs> I mean, you're international. Uh-huh. If someone can catch a glimpse of you, where are the next kind of two, three places you'll be on some sort of national stage where people can, can mm-hmm. hear, speak to you and, and shake your hand? Where, 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 where are you going next? Well, I, you know, I, I'm doing more with NAFA. You know, I wasn't I wasn't doing that much with NAFA, but I, I, I got to tell you something. And I know you guys are behind this thing, but I I was very impressed when Robel and Abade got the got the award um, and she invited me. And that's when I showed showed up and I saw everything that was going on here. So I am trying to do individual statewide. I didn't want to do one big NAFA meeting. I wanted to see if I could get out and be visible and and try to get more people uh, involved, you know, for local NAFA organizations. But I'm, 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 I'm going to be in uh, uh, for exotic places. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in. Um, uh, it looks like Portugal, and it looks like I'll be in the, in the um, Poland. Um, hmm. and, well, the beauty of it is, it's kind of the discussion points I have. It's, it doesn't matter where you're from; it's all the same. Everyone's got parents, you know. Everyone's got children. It's a very, you know, human, uh, human thing. So that's. That's really what I'm trying to do is to press in the importance of what we do. And if you really want to do something that's worthwhile, I, I, I think the next evolution of the business, I, I think fraternals are there already. You know, they're like a one stop shop. Um, you know, you show up, I'm doing a gig. I do gigs for, for Knights of Columbus and what have you. And they have all of these other programs which are ideally suited for the meaning and purpose type things, you know, to get older people involved. There's another group called GBU, which uh what they do is they match up to a certain dollar amount a contribution that you'd make towards uh you know certain organizations so it makes the person feel vital and it's there i i I think to some extent that's so if i'm looking at product development beyond just the products themselves is that stuff is the idea what is it we can do or who could we make a partnership with so that people feel important and vital beyond just knowing if they die, their family will get X or, you know, they've got an income coming in. So I think I think those are the things I think fraternals are there. I just wish they fraternals had more confidence <laughs> in the great value proposition they have, because I don't think sometimes they get it. So um, um, uh, I, I think a fraternal type of approach, other benefits other than just, than, yeah. you know, the life insurance and the investments would, would be cool. Well, and how about this? I mean, I hadn't thought to ask you this, but since you bring that up, because I love the fact that you're you're saying do something that's making the person feel vital. What do you say? So in, in NAFA Nation, right, we have a lot of retired members. And we have a lot of members who are retiring. What would you say to them? I would say that they should stay active in in NAFA. They they you know they should be there. They should be able to talk to the younger people and do that. Because I'll I'll tell you what you know you're going to get most people will get bored out of their gourd you know and you have a lot to contribute and you know what it is too is that sometimes when people feel that way they 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 don't understand the importance of of their experience and what they can give to someone. And so because they know it, everyone knows it. That's not true. That's not true. And so show up to a NAFA meeting for crying out loud, get there, you know, see some people and what have you, stay vital, you know. And 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 I think that's an invaluable resource to have. And uh, maybe the local NAFA meetings should put people up on the stage or, you know, have a panel of people and have them talk about the stories and, and not just war stories, but I mean, you know, that that type of stuff. So I, I I I didn't even think of it until you just brought it up. I think that's an invaluable resource that NAFA yes. has. And, it is. Uh, and, and 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 a lot of the people, you're right. They self-select out, saying, "Oh, no one wants to listen to me." And it's like, no, you couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, the the, inse- the insecurity of uh, you know I'm a well, it's, that's part of you know the, the idea of retirement is go out and play golf. Well, then you then you start feeling insecure about. No, you know, no, you, they don't even know what they know. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? So um, um, I, I, that's, a, that's a great idea, Suzanne. Well, Chris, it's time. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Suzanne, do you have anything before we go to, to Joe for the lightning round? Joe, we do have a lightning round. And oh, uh, okay. lightning round is it's always interesting because the rule of thumb is very simple, is whatever comes to mind first, 
you don't have to get prepared. Like I see you getting prepared over there. You're like, okay, let me get comfortable in my seat. <laughs> He's a competitor. He's a competitor. <laughs> right? He's like, okay, what are you going to hit me with, right? There's no fastballs. There's no surprise. I'm not going to ask you about politics. I'm not going to ask you about, you know, uh, where you were when you were 17 years old. You know, was that you? I'm not going to ask you those things, right? So I'm just going to ask you things to give our, you know, people know of you. People don't know you, mm-hmm. right? And I think one of the things this podcast does for people is it brings a human element to part of what I think is missing in our industry because they may not be able to connect with the Joe Jordan. Um, they may not have made MDRT, but something you said today might inspire them to do so, mm-hmm. right? And so um, we asked this lightning round for the, for that purpose. So Suzanne, do you have anything before we go to the, I wish I had a lightning yeah, some sort of glass <laughs> yeah, we, we still are investigating that sound effect. Uh, just another shout out to thank you, Columbus Life, for the sponsorship. And uh, and then, well, yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. So we haven't gotten to the way. We didn't, we didn't mention this. Joe oh, is by, the, the, by the way, John Baltimore, who is the uh, who is the president of uh, Columbus Life. I want to give him a shout out. I, I saw him on stage. They actually sponsored me. And uh, 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 he's. Uh, he comes from a culture that really understands what the business is about. So uh, thank you. Thank you for sponsoring this again too, John. Awesome. I was just going to say, Joe, maybe people don't know, Joe is a prolific rugby player. So I have no doubt he can knock this thing out of the, no problem. (laughs) He can handle anything coming his way. You know something a little different. Okay. So test him, test him, Chris. All right. So Joe, we'll start off pretty, pretty easily. So, um, First thing I want to ask is, um, you you live in New York, yes? Yes, I do, yes. So I'm going to ask the Mets or the Yankees? Uh, Yankees. Okay. The Yankees or the Knicks? Uh, Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so see how easy that is? It's, it's not yeah. hard, right? So whatever comes to mind first, that, that's what it is. So, so Joe... Um, the one thing that you've learned that has inspired you the most. Well, I, I, I think what it is, is, is understanding the power of storytelling and my own. Um, I, I, I just went blindly through life and what have you. And then I look back in terms of the, 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 the situation my mother found herself in. I can see her laying in bed, crying at night making a decision that the girls can't go to college. One of them got a full scholarship. So you imagine what that did to them. And, and, and so uh, it, it really took me until I was in my fifties that I made that connection. So I, I can't tell you how, so, so that was, that was the big, that was the big lesson learned um, was beyond the numbers, what impact it would have on people's lives. Everybody needs a coach, right? The, so the best in the game. Michael Jordan had a coach, you know, uh, Tom Brady had a coach. Joe Jordan, who would who would you say would be your mentor or your coach? There were two of them, Bob Ben Moshe, who uh, who I actually worked with at Payne Weber, who and I was the one who brought him over to Met. He 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 took Met public and then he went to AIG and, and he he paid the government back one hundred eighty five billion plus a twenty billion dollar profit. No one's ever done that. I was very close with him. It was the first time in a corporate setting that I saw someone who did things all for the right reasons, all for the right reasons, and and have the courage to do that. The other one is Nick Murray, and Nick Murray is a prolific writer in financial services, and he makes things so succinct and uh, 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 and easy. And so he gave me the intellectual prowess, if you would, the the things that he made. He made that stuff simple. So I think those two those two people have really had a dramatic impact on on society yeah nick murray's great nick murray's still one of the great ones you know his stuff is legendary um mdrt you mentioned you spoke on the main stage right right what did that mean to you to have that platform to say you know what i'm here that was that was just wild and you know um you know, I was very nervous about it, you know, because they only gave me 20 minutes. And and then Queen Noor came after me and she she went over by like 15 minutes, you know, and anesthetized the audience. I don't mind saying that because it was true. 
but but um, that was important because what happened is that got me able to get all of this pent up stuff I had in out. And 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 so that was the first time that I expressed the anger with my father uh, for, for making those decisions that he didn't do the New York life person you know, for what he didn't do. And and so it, it took a couple of years after that to really for me to to assemble that. But but, you know, it was 20,000 people from around the world. You know, my wife walked in and saw the saw the auditorium almost faint, you know. And um, uh, but uh, no, that was great. And I have to thank uh, uh, Jack Turner, who was a previous in the 80s, see, uh, president of MDRT, who, who got me into that. And they saw the emotion uh, packed that I had and I opened the meeting. So I was the opening speaker. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, that was, uh, that was quite a trip. The good thing is, is there's 20,000 people. You can't see them. You know, you got these mm -hmm. lights in your eyes. You know? The biggest audience I spoke to was 30,000 and that was I, I, Thailand again, but you can't see them. So, so you don't know, but, but, um, uh, but anyway, that was, that was powerful. Joe, two more questions. Mm -hmm. If I was starting in the business today, uh -huh. Talk to our NAFA family out there. If you're starting in the business today, what's the one piece of advice you would give somebody if they were starting today? Okay. I would tell them the business is built on two principles, prospecting and everything else. <laughs> and, and that's not a joke. It's real. I mean, if you continue to prospect and find and do the energy towards making that, you'll make it. I don't care how smart or dumb you are, you know, but you could be the, you could be the Einstein of financial services. If you ain't talking to anybody, it's not there. That's why, that's why there has to be something beyond the gray matter to make that happen. And and you have to feel a passion to do it. To, to, who wants to put up with that? You know, I mean, I, I, to this day, I do it, you know, people don't call you back and, you know, they ghost you, the, uh, someone's not nice to you, all that other stuff. So that that's what I think. I, I would say you have to put a premium on the idea of prospecting and figuring out how to do that better. I mean, it might be, a, well, I'd just say different because back when I was doing it was dial and smile. So now you have all of this technology and ways to promote yourself. And so anything you could do that keeps you. And I like the idea of daily. I had a thing, daily contact commitment. I like that I did it every day. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, my, my uh, 74, my, my manager said, you have to contact 10, 10 people a day. And so I didn't know I couldn't do it. So I started doing it. And so it gets it out of the way and then you can get other stuff done. So that's, that's, that's the most important thing. I think we are habitual people and, uh, you know, habits, habits are contagious, right? If we start them early, then we have a tendency to continue them. Um, last question. <laughs> this is from a Chicago into a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. Chicago pizza or New York pizza? New York pizza, man. Oh. <laughs> you know, why did I know that was going to happen? You, know, you got to have this, the, the thing that just kind of comes over. I get it, right? Do you um, fold over your slice, Joe? Do you fold? Yes, I do. <laughs> All right. Also a folder. Yeah. I'm sure, Joe, you could give us your favorite place in New York. If I'm in New York, where should I go? If I'm going to get a slice oh, of, of pie, oh. that's I know that's what you call it. Oh, man. Oh. I can't. I can't think of the name of the place. Uh, Suzanne, I'm stumping Joe Jordan. Look at that. I know. Look yeah, at that. Look at that. So he's in so, Manhattan. It's like too many places. It's like too too many options. Too many options, right? <laughs> yeah, there's too, and they, and they change all the time. You know, um, I'd say Keen Steakhouse, K E E N E S Steakhouse, and what they have is they have the old time uh, pipes, literally thousands of them, all on the ceiling. You know. Um, not, not the more modern ones you see now, but ones back in the 1700 type stuff. Why it's there, I don't know, but that's a great place. Keen Sun, it's in the 30s on the west side. Got it. When I visit New York, when you visit New York, you have to go there. Um, Mr. Joe Jordan, it's, it, it is a pleasure every time I get a chance to spend some time with you. We always learn something new. Um, we've learned some stories about you today. Go out and get his book, go out and see him on tour. Um, if you have an agency, I know that Joe would be happy to come speak in your agency and and uh, and and bring a powerful impact. Um, thank you so much for all you've done for the industry and what you continue to do for NAFA. Um, we applaud you um, uh, virtually, at least. Suzanne, 
Yeah. Ditto all that. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nathan Nation. Thank you, Chris. Joe, do you have anything before I close this out? Final words? Um, uh, yeah, I, I just, you know, appreciate, the, you know, the time and uh, anything I can do to help NAFA, let me know. Um, and and I especially, the last thing I'd like to do, I, I would like to do some more meetings at agencies. I like the more local place, but especially the young people, because they're not hearing it. You know what I mean? They're not, they're, 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 it, it doesn't exist in our culture anymore. It's all about the AUM. And it is, but it ain't, you know. Right. So thank you, Joe Jordan. Thank you, Suzanne. I'll close this out. Thank you for listening to today, uh, Advisors Today's podcast, NAFA's Advisor Today podcast, where we focus on education, uplifting, and empowering advisors of tomorrow. Go out and have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joe. We appreciate it, you and everything you do, sir. Thank you. And, my, and I, you, both of you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for NAFA's Advisor Today podcast series. Make sure to subscribe to get future episodes. And if you're interested in coming on the show, let us know.